It seems like we have to do these every few months, but here we go again. On May 3rd, 2023, two small drones exploded over the Kremlin Senate Dome, right in the heart of Moscow. No notable damage was reported, but nevertheless, it was a serious situation. The Russian government's immediate response was outrage, declaring Ukraine responsible and labeling it as an unacceptable escalation in the war. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was skeptical. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told reporters that Russia's claims should be taken with a very large shaker of salt, because apparently one grain was not enough. Meanwhile, Zelensky, on a trip to NATO's newest member Finland, denied responsibility, saying that Ukraine does not attack Putin or Moscow, they fight on their own territory. As a result, we find ourselves in another international whodunit. Today, let's get rid of that grain of salt and go over three of the most likely candidates, and half of one, to see if we can get a better understanding of what happened. We start with Ukraine because, well, it is the obvious choice on the surface. After all, Kyiv has been at full-scale war with Russia since February 2022, and further engaged in a shadow war since 2014. Russia has been attacking Ukrainian cities throughout, and as we have discussed previously, removing Zelensky from power one way or another was a key part of Russia's initial invasion plans. Attacking Moscow would just be Kyiv's way of playing tit for tat. The intelligence community is fairly confident that Ukraine has the ability to do this. There have been multiple drone strikes at Ingalls Air Base, and the odds-on theory is that Ukraine has been responsible for them. The key thing is that Ingalls is further from Ukrainian front lines than Moscow is, so if Ukrainian drones can hit the base, they can hit the capital. It is also possible that Ukraine used assets within Russia or near Moscow itself to conduct the attack, which would help explain why Russia failed to shoot down the drones. Nevertheless, there are a few facets of the operation that would be odd if Ukraine were responsible. First, Russia claims that Putin was not there at the time. No one seems to be disputing that, so let's take it as a given. Ukraine undoubtedly has intelligence assets in Russia. Although Kyiv might not know where Putin is at all times, planners should at least know where he is sometimes. They are better than you or I at hashtag where's Putin. Given that, it does not make sense to execute the operation at a random hour in the middle of the night when he is not around, if assassination were actually the goal. Moreover, not to diminish capital attacks like this, but the drones exploded in a manner akin to fireworks in the night sky. Even if Putin had been at home, it is hard to see how the strike could have been lethal. However, if we move past assuming that the attack was meant to kill, then we can enter the realm of symbolic attacks. Hitting the flagpole at the top of the dome might be as symbolic as it gets, feeling more like something a video game would ask you to do than real life. Daring symbolic attacks like this have historical precedent. The Doolittle Raid during World War II is the most famous of these. Japan's 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor left the United States reeling. Seeking a morale boost, U.S. military strategists turned to Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. Doolittle formed a plan to strike Japan on its home islands. The scheme began by sailing the aircraft carrier USS Hornet and escort ships from California to a safe distance from Japan. Aboard the Hornet were 16 B-25B Mitchell bombers, each specially armed for the mission. At a moment's notice, Doolittle's team took off for their intended targets, mostly military and industrial facilities. Ten went straight for Tokyo. Three headed to Yokohama and Yokosuka. Two flew to Osaka and Kobe, and one went for Nagoya. Rather than making a round trip, which would expose the fleet to a counterattack. The original plan called for the B-25s to land in China. However, a Japanese patrol boat had spotted the Hornet earlier that day. Although the fleet destroyed it, Doolittle decided to launch early in case the boat had sent a message home. 
one slight problem. This meant that the B-25s had to cover 200 more miles than originally intended. As a result, the planes had insufficient fuel to reach their Chinese landing points. One decided to land past Vladivostok in the then-neutral Soviet Union. The rest either crashed in China or ditched at sea. Despite those measures, three died in action. Japan also captured eight crewmen, three of whom were executed, and another died as a POW before repatriation. Nonetheless, the mission was a success. Morale in the United States soared, and the crew received a hero's welcome upon their return. Back in the present, there are two key differences between the Doolittle raid and the Kremlin drone attack. First, Ukraine is not facing the same morale problem that the United States was. Remember, Doolittle was trying to undo the embarrassment of U.S. failures at Pearl Harbor. In contrast, Ukraine is still riding the high of surviving Russia's initial assault on Kyiv. Second, to the extent that attacks on Russian soil boost Ukrainian morale, it is not like there is a shortage of them here. Yes, this one was higher profile, but the flip side is that it had no direct military consequences for the war. The real morale concern should instead be in the West, for whom funding the war is optional. Ukraine is well aware of this. It is why Zelensky began going on charm tours once it became safe to do so, and it is why so many others have been invited to Kyiv for photo ops with him. But Washington, wait a second, what on earth is happening in this photo? What did this poor woman walk in on? I honestly do not know the answer, so let me go do some research and I will get back to you about it at the end of the video. Anyway... Washington has been clear that it does not want Ukraine to engage in provocative attacks that risk giving Moscow the pretext for more adventurous actions. That is why the United States is only supplying the short-range Gimler's rockets for the HIMARS system, not the longer-range attackums. In sum, Ukraine may very well have conducted the operation. But if Kyiv is responsible, it would raise questions of what exactly the endgame was here. Then again, we did just have a video on the difficulty of seeing through the fog of war, and that might be why understanding the logic here is difficult. Maybe Ukraine really wants Russia to move anti-air defenses to Moscow, but that strategy would require Russia to take the bait. It's all speculation at this point. Next up is the possibility of an inside job. We'll spend more time on this one, because the logic is more complicated. The basic idea is that this is a false flag operation, planned and executed by Russian authorities, to create the pretext to do something that would be politically difficult to do otherwise. What that something is remains to be seen, and may be hard to draw a direct answer to. One possibility is to set the conditions for a second round of mobilization, following this one from September 2022. Russia appears very worried about a Ukrainian counteroffensive. If the failed Russian winter offensives have bled their own front lines dry, another mobilization may be necessary to stop Ukraine from making rapid gains. A high-profile attack on the capital allegedly shows the Russian people that Ukraine is a dangerous enemy, and the only way to stop a Nazi regime is to destroy it at its source. We are Russians in this together, as Putin would tell you, so you should support the new conscription efforts. If that sounds a little hard to believe, remember that you have not been hearing similar narratives exclusively for more than a decade. Speaking of World War II-era opponents, another possibility is to have an excuse for crowd control. May 9th normally sees enormous crowds lining up for Moscow's Victory Day Parade, an annual celebration commemorating the Soviet victory over Germany in World War II, or what Russia calls the Great Patriotic War. If you have been watching this channel even for a short time, you have seen an endless stream of photos from these parades. That is because it is hard to line up Russian soldiers and materiel for photo shoots under normal circumstances. It being an annual public gathering, it represents a unique vulnerability for the Kremlin. 
in terms of a foreign attack, especially from Ukraine. The risk there is low. World leaders are often in attendance, and this year's included a number of them from post-Soviet states that still have decent relations with Russia. The real danger is large crowds of ordinary people. Scenes like this from the 2019 parade. Just ask Romanian autocrat Nicolae Ceausescu, whose December 21, 1989 speech got overrun by an angry audience. He and his wife were shot by a firing squad just four days later on Christmas, and to this day, they remain the last people executed by Romania. Under today's circumstances, marches like this Kremlin-sponsored one from 2019 are dangerous. It is too easy for government security forces to lose control of the crowd, never mind the fact that Putin was in the middle of it. Canceling the parade outright might have looked like a tempting option, and indeed that was the strategy Russia chose in many locations outside of Moscow. But canceling the Moscow parade itself was not an option, given its importance in crafting national pride. Thus, it continued in a scaled-back fashion. Using the drone attacks as evidence that it is unsafe for Russian citizens to attend would have been a good excuse for that, though it is unclear how much that played into Russia's narrative. There is clear evidence that the parade itself was indeed scaled back, maybe due to this, or maybe due to materiel embarrassment, which might have come as good news if your hand was in pain. As the parade marched on, Western media circles noted that only one tank, and a World War II model at that, paraded through Red Square. And there was no airshow. The lack of modern tanks led to speculation that Russia is facing a shortage due to the invasion. However, modern tanks were present at some other parades in Russia, so the exact meaning here is unclear. A third possibility is to trigger the aforementioned Western pushback against Ukraine to cut off military aid. Responding to the incident, Kremlin Press Secretary Dmitry Peskov claimed that it was a joint Ukrainian-American attack on the capital. The American part seemed to be a completely speculative assertion. But if instead it reframed as, Ukraine did this because of Western aid, well, now it is an argument that Biden should abandon assistance to Ukraine if it is going to be used like this. Such a narrative probably will not change assessments within the U.S. military. But to the extent that Western citizens believe the Kremlin, and then apply pressure at the ballot box, then it could matter. It is doubtful that the purpose of such a false flag would be as pretext for aerial bombing of Western Ukraine, Although it is true that those stepped up in the aftermath, likely to try to soften Ukraine's upcoming counterattack, it is not as though Russia relies on excuses to do that. They have been a part of the war from the start. Whatever the motivation, a false flag would make sense of the weak attack. If the goal is just to rile up the Russian population, there is no need to cause serious damage. The main criticism that I have seen regarding this theory is that it is embarrassing for the Kremlin. Average Russians will see drones penetrating Moscow's airspace as evidence of incompetence, not exactly the aura that Putin wants to project, and therefore this will counteract whatever rally-round-the-flag effect Putin seeks to obtain. This is difficult to believe. The best Western equivalent I can think of would be if an Iranian drone struck the White House. If that happened, I ask you, what the modal American's response would be. 1. Fire every general in sight, or 2. A rally round the flag effect with demands to bomb Iran. If September 2001 is the best indicator, option 2 would win by a landslide. There would be a hint of number 1, of course, but that would mostly be a topic of discussion for bureaucrats and insiders. Now stir in Putin's control over the media, and option two will completely dominate in Russia. That said, someone is definitely getting fired because of this. But that may very well be a feature, not a bug. Let's go back in time to 1987, which has history's closest parallel, all thanks to this plane. 
A bold West German pilot named Matthias Rust took off from Helsinki, by some miracle penetrated Soviet airspace without getting shot down, and landed his plane just outside of Red Square, and within sight of the drone's target 36 years later. As you would expect, Gorbachev sacked a number of individuals in the aftermath, but they just so happened to be the people holding up the reforms he sought to implement. Whether that is happening here is basically impossible to tell. Who is a threat to Putin's regime is such inside Kremlin baseball that I do not think it is worth trying to guess unless you have the resources of a state intelligence agency. But it is plausible. Competition within Russia's military structures is something that we have discussed before. Maybe Putin felt like reining in those responsible for air defenses, though given the recent trouble with non-traditional forces, perhaps this is not the best time for that. Ironically, others believe that the alleged failures of Russian air defenses are further evidence of a false flag, that there is no way a drone could get that far unless Russia let it. I do not see it that way. Russian incompetence was one of the major themes at the beginning of the invasion, and this may just be an extension of that. To be clear, I have cautioned that we should not overcorrect our beliefs and now assume that Russia is bad at everything. As the war has progressed, when Russian mistakes have become evident, the Kremlin has made adjustments. Moscow's air defenses have not been tested exactly like this before, so it is possible the rot was always present, but that it was just now exposed. Now for a short extra half-theory, a false flag not approved at the highest levels. The basic idea is the same as before, except Putin did not order it. Instead, someone else did it to evoke a similar reaction, perhaps because they want Russia to prosecute a more aggressive war than what is currently happening. The Mukden incident is a perfect historical parallel to this. This was the bombing of a Japanese railroad in Manchuria that Japan used as a pretext to invade the region. Later, a League of Nations commission would conclude that it was an inside job by the Japanese military, apparently upset that the Japanese government did not want to pursue a deeper conflict with China. The silly part is that the bombing, much like the Kremlin incident, did little real damage. It is not a good sign if the Japanese magazine that published this picture of the damage felt that it was necessary to circle where that damage was. Indeed, the bomb went off at 10.20 p.m., and a train went along the tracks without issue within 10 minutes later. But all that matters little when you control the media, and thus you control the narrative. The final possibility is that Russian partisans committed the attack. There have been a few high-profile incidents with potential ties to such groups, including the killing of Daria Dugina, the destruction of Nord Stream, and most recently, the bombing of a St. Petersburg cafe right over there. However, there are no firm confirmations that partisans committed any of those attacks, and there are plenty of competing theories as to what happened. If such a free Russia movement were active, it would make sense of how the attack failed to penetrate inside the dome's walls. But there is still something weird here. Militant groups need funding and volunteers to sustain themselves. Acquiring both requires them to advertise their services, and a symbolic attack on a capital would certainly qualify as such an advertisement. The one problem here is that no one seems to be trying to claim credit for it, which is odd if you are trying to draw attention to yourself. Perhaps they are just waiting for the right moment. Who do you think is responsible? Let me know in the comments. If you want to know more about the invasion, you will love my book that investigates its many possible causes. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. Okay, I legitimately had no idea what was going on when I first saw this photo. My initial guess was that the rooster was Boris Johnson's idea of a nice gift to Zelensky, and the woman in the background was perhaps a translator, and that this was her genuine reaction to the bizarre situation that she found herself in. But no.
The instigator was her. Apparently I missed this from about a year ago, but the rooster ceramic goes back to the beginning of the war, when Russia was shelling a small town northwest of Kiev. By some miracle, this set of cabinets survived, along with the rooster sitting on top. Afterward, it became a meme, representing Ukrainian tenacity, and apparently making a good gift to visiting heads of state. Nevertheless, I get the feeling that this guy thinks it's a security concern. <laughs>